You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. When it comes to the Republican health care plan, the American Health Care Act, as the House calls their bill, the Better Care Reconciliation Act, as the Senate calls their bill, or the Obamacare repeal and go fuck yourselves, as I like to call it, Republican members of Congress, with a reach around from conservative pundits, are trying to declare the truth out of bounds. Hillary Clinton tweeted last week, forget death panels. If Republicans pass this bill, they're the death party. With a link to a study from Harvard researchers that says the Senate bill could result in 18,000 to 28,000 deaths per year in 2026, by 2026. Hillary was scolded for this because, of course, she was, because she's supposed to shut up and go away now, like John Kerry and John McCain did after they lost their presidential bids. Whatever happened to those guys, anyway? But yeah, it's the truth. The truth. People will die if the Republicans get their way. People will die. People will be bankrupted. Older and sicker people will be priced out of the health insurance market. The Senate bill ends Medicaid as we know it. Medicaid is a government-run health insurance plan that covers millions of Americans, millions of pregnant women, single mothers, people with disabilities, disabled children, seniors with low incomes. Rural hospitals will close. People with pre-existing conditions will find themselves unable to get insurance. If they can get insurance, it won't cover the condition that they had that was pre-existing. And you know what? Sooner or later, we all have pre-existing conditions. Lots of us, myself included, are born with conditions, born with pre-existing conditions. And we have Republican shitbag senators out there saying that people who have pre-existing conditions have no one but themselves to blame for their pre-existing conditions. And here we are. Here we are pushing policies that will kill people. That's politics. That's just GOP elected officials keeping a promise they made to their base, pointing out that these policies will kill people. That's uncivil discourse. That's overheated rhetoric. That is not okay. But it is a fact If this bill passes, tens of thousands of people will die. A 2009 Harvard study found that uninsured working age Americans have a 40% higher death risk than their insured counterparts. And that study, pre-Obamacare, found that 45,000 deaths per year were linked to a lack of health care coverage. Long comes Obamacare, cuts the uninsured rate in half. People still die for lack of access to health insurance under Obamacare, but fewer people die. That's why I like to call Obamacare evil, but less evil, but still evil, because it didn't cover everyone, and it wasn't designed to cover everyone. We have to remember, we liberals, we need to remind ourselves every once in a while that Obamacare, that that whole plan was the Heritage Foundation, a right-wing think tank alternative to single payer. And we have been backed into a corner, liberals and progressives, backed into a corner where we are endlessly having to defend what was the Republican alternative to single payer. And what we need to do, of course, now is pivot to just arguing for universal coverage, for single payer, for Medicaid, for all. And hopefully we will do that. And universal coverage is in the Democratic platform, the 2016 Democratic platform, universal coverage, universal care. It is in there. It's not, however, on the lips of a lot of Democratic politicians who are out there arguing against the Obamacare repeal. And it needs to be. And we will get to that. Hopefully we will get to that. Hopefully we will pivot to that after we defeat the GOP plan to gut Obamacare and kill tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of us. Kill you. Kill your kid. Kill your mom. And that's just reality. And it can't be uncivil or out of bounds to point out the reality of the situation, that if this bill passes, Americans will die. Because the GOP plan goes further than rolling back Obamacare, ends Medicaid, puts lifetime caps on medical expenses, exceed that cap, and that is it. These are death panels on steroids. And the Republican Party, like Hillary said, if this passes, becomes the party of death. All brought to you by a con man and the voters that he managed to con. Trump promised lower cost coverage for everybody and that unlike his competitors in the Republican primaries, he wouldn't cut Medicaid or Medicare. And yet, here the fuck we are. (sighs) 
I want to encourage people to call and call and call. If you live in Nevada, West Virginia, Maine, Alaska, Colorado, your senators need to hear from you. Dean Heller, Shelley Moore Capito, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, Rob Portman, and Cory Gardner are all potential no votes. And we just need three Republican senators to vote no to block this thing. You can reach your senator by calling the main U.S. Senate switchboard and asking to be connected to your senator's office. That number, 202-224-3121. And it is particularly important. Again, if you live in Nevada, West Virginia, Maine, Alaska, or Colorado, or grew up there, to call your goddamn senators. Heller, Moore, Capito, Collins, Murkowski, Portman, Gardner. They need to hear from you. And Democratic senators, Democratic Congress people, they need to hear from us too. They need to hear from us that we want them after they get out of this crouch, after we defend and hopefully save Obamacare, that we need to pivot to arguing for what we don't have right now, which is universal coverage. We have cut with Obamacare the uninsured rate in half. So rather than 45,000 people dying every year for lack of access to medical care, we're down to 22,000 people dying per year for lack of access to health care. That has to end. No more arguing for Republican half measures or Republican compromises. We need to argue for Democratic solutions to our health care nightmare. All right, coming up on today's show on the micro free edition of the Savage Love Cast. Tons of your questions, tons of my answers. And Seth Stevens Davidowitz is here to talk about his new book, Everybody Lies, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. It's a great book, and we have a great conversation about it. And on the Magnum edition of the Savage Love Cast, furries, a man's boyfriend is super turned on by furry porn, and the caller is worried that there's bestiality in the mix too. I chat on the Magnum with Vero from the Feral Attraction Podcast, an advice show from a furry perspective. He is hilarious, and it's an interesting conversation. Also on the Magnum, you'll hear this. In our talks, I've expressed that it's more than just my missing some tits in my face. To get the Magnum for yourself or as a gift for a loved one and to support the Lovecast, go to www.savagelovecast.com and subscribe to the show. The Magnum edition is twice as long, more guests, more calls, and no ads. And now, your calls. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Thrive Market, the new convenient way to get the highest quality natural organic groceries delivered to your door. Try it for free for 30 days and get an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Bull & Branch, luxury, affordable, fair trade certified sheets. Get 50 bucks off a set of sheets plus free shipping by going to bullandbranch.com and entering savage today's episode of the love cast is brought to you by five four club fashionable men's clothing curated and sent right to your door get 50 percent off your first package at five four club when you use the offer code savage just go to five four club spell it out f-i-v-e-f-o-u-r-c-l-u-b.com and use the offer code savage hey dan um i'm a 25 year old guy on the west coast i've been hooking up with a guy in his late 20s that i met on grinder last summer the problem is that his girlfriend doesn't know. So we met last summer and before we hooked up, um, it came up in ca- conversation that he has a girlfriend because we were talking about him being bi and stuff. And um, I just assumed they had some kind of monogamous relationship. But after we had sex, I asked him, um, what does your girlfriend think about you hooking up with guys? And he laughed and said, she doesn't know. So... I probably should have cut off contact with him at that point, but the sex was really, really good. And I've been um, hooking up with him on and off over the past year. Um, I should mention that we have safe sex and we use condoms for anal and oral. So there's basically no risk that his girlfriend's going to get anything. But we do um, rim each other without any kind of barrier. He's on the down low, so he won't give me his number. We only communicate on Grindr, and he's very vague and secretive. About his life and work but um, recently we had a conversation where he revealed some personal information and I was able to use that to find his social media and he doesn't know that I found his social media so I'm looking at pictures of like him and his girlfriend and what they did on the weekend and it's pretty weird um, he gave me like a fake name and like won't give me his number and now I don't have this window into his life and like his girlfriend's social media and all that stuff 
And it looks like they've been together three years. And I should also mention that they don't own a house or have kids together, but they do live together. So I think she should know what he's doing before they do have kids or get a house together because she's going to find out eventually. Um, but I also don't think he deserves to have his life ruined because of this. And I don't see how telling her wouldn't ruin his life. Um, she'd break up with him. People would find out why they broke up. And I don't know what his family's like, so I don't know what the social repercussions would be for him. I know she seems bad, but I really think he's a guy and I don't want to hurt him. Um, I also don't want this to blow up in my face. He has my nudes and knows where I work, where I live, but I also have his nudes, know where he lives, and now I know where he works. He has told his girlfriend because he's hooking up with a bunch of other guys. But I just have a feeling that he would be able to figure it out. So part of me thinks that he's having sex with all these other guys, so maybe it's not my problem. You know, it's not like I'm enabling him cheating because he would be doing it anyway. And he is doing it anyway when I'm not around. And then another part of me thinks, well, maybe she'll find out on her own eventually before they get married and have kids. But they've already been together three years and somehow she still hasn't found out. So... Like, I don't know, is she turning a blind eye to it? Is he lying about her not knowing? I don't know. I don't know what's going on. So I'm moving this summer. So I'm leaning towards just walking away from this mess. But I also feel like I'm in this unique position where I actually know, like, who he is and who the girlfriend is. And so maybe I should tell her what's going on. I don't know. I'm leaning towards just, like, walking away. But I don't know. How, is there a way to tell her what's going on without this, like, blowing up in my face. I don't know, Dan. Uh, any advice would be appreciated. I am every bit as conflicted as you are, caller. I don't know what to tell you to do. On the one hand, you could, and maybe you should, walk away. You coulda and shoulda walked away a year ago. I think you'd be feeling right now a whole lot less guilt had you walked away a year ago when he first told you, or however long ago it was, when he told you that his girlfriend didn't know that he was hooking up not just with a guy, but apparently with scores of guys. And I wonder if on some level your desire to reach out and let his girlfriend know who it is that she's living with and sleeping with and potentially one day marrying isn't an effort to expunge your guilt and sort of get you off the hook for your complicity in not just what he's done to his girlfriend, but what you've helped him do to his girlfriend. And I'm sorry, you use condoms for anal and oral sex, but not for rimming. And therefore, the sex isn't 100% safe. And even with condoms and without rimming, condoms for oral, condoms for anal, it's not 100% safe because there are skin-to-skin -skin contact, sexually transmitted infections that condoms offer some protection for, but not perfect or 100% protection for. You're doing a really good job protecting yourself, using condoms that way from syphilis, gonorrhea, HIV, uh, not doing such a great job with condoms all by themselves, protecting yourself from, from herpes or HPV, and therefore not a good job protecting her from herpes or HPV. So I wonder if your desire to reach out and let her know now, now when you're moving away, and I think that's kind of an incriminating detail, something you should probably contemplate. You're on your way out the door, and now you're going to tell the girlfriend what's up. You didn't tell her what was up when you were fucking him or still wanting to fuck him. But now that you're not going to be fucking him anymore, now you're going to toss over your shoulder the news to the girlfriend that her boyfriend is a cheating piece of shit who's putting her at risk and therefore not sacrificing anything yourself. You kept his dick coming for as long as you could, and on your way out, you called it. All that said, she probably deserves to know. And at some point, she's going to find out anyway. If he's having sex with lots of other guys, if he's being this reckless, she's going to find out sooner or later and better sooner than later. And why not you? You know, if you put yourself in her shoes for just a moment, wouldn't you want someone to let you know? Whether he was cheating with guys or girls or rutabagas or elephants, who knows? You would want someone to let you know before you married or scrambled your DNA together with this dirtbag. And who knows, maybe once the news is out there, once he's 
outed to her, which is a brutal tactic, as I've said a million times, and should be reserved for brutes. But what this guy is doing is kind of brutal to her. And what you helped him do and participated in or complicit in is also kind of brutal to her. And so maybe he has the outing coming. And you never know what's going to happen after infidelities, serial cheating is revealed. Now, most cases, serial cheating, this kind of cheating is not something a relationship can survive. But who knows? People often have these long, drawn-out, hashed-out conversations after infidelities are exposed, and they come to a different understanding about their relationship and how it's going to work. Maybe she's been chomping at the bit to eat pussy or to have sex with other guys, and they can transition to a non-monogamous or monogamous relationship and an honest one as opposed to the non-monogamous dishonest relationship she finds herself in now or hasn't found herself and isn't aware that she's in now. So yeah, I doubt your motives. They are not pure. But I think she deserves to know and needs to know. And somebody's going to reach out and tell her. And you worry that he has your nudes. He knows where you live. He knows where you work. You have his nudes. So Mutually assured destruction. And you now know where he lives and works. And maybe that'll protect you. But also if he's sleeping with lots of other guys, an anonymous account created on some social media platform where you can reach out to her on that same social media platform and let her know what he's been up to, unlikely that could be traced back to you. I get so many calls from people who are 10 years, 15 years into a marriage and a couple of young children into a marriage uh, who've just discovered that their partner has this secret second life and that had they known they never would have married or yoked themselves to that person really for the rest of their lives by scrambling their DNA together. And they wish often that someone, one of the people that their husband or wife had been cheating with all these years or all those years before they married, had said something to them. They wish they had found out because the disruption before marriage when they were just living together would have been more manageable than the disruption or the efforts to extricate themselves from the relationship are once there's marriage and children and divorce and custody battles uh, involved in parting. Yeah, I guess I come down on the side of let her know. Let her know what he's been up to. And don't do this shit again. And if you find yourself in a circumstance like this again, don't keep fucking the guy until you're ready to move or you're done with him and then let the girlfriend know. You're not white knighting at that point. You are in a way assuaging your own guilt and perhaps retaliating against the guy. And not from the moral high ground either, but from the sewer where you've been standing with him for a long time. Eating healthy can be hard because it takes time and it is expensive. That's where thrivemarket.com can change the way you eat and shop. Thrive Market is the new convenient way to get the highest quality natural organic groceries like healthy snacks, supplements, and foods to stock your pantry at 25 to 50% less than even the discount stores. Thrive Market is like Costco meets Whole Foods online, but better. Pay just 60 bucks a year and get wholesale pricing all year long. The average Thrive.com customer saves about 40 bucks per order and Thrive guarantees that you'll save more than your membership fee in your first two orders. In fact, they'll let you test drive the savings for free before you even buy your membership. They make healthy eating easy and affordable. Take organic coconut oil. It is good for you. It has so many uses. Some we've even talked about here on the sex podcast and at stores, that shit is 15 bucks a jar. They have it at thrivemarket.com for less than $8. Also, if you have dietary restrictions, thrivemarket.com is your best friend. They offer over 1,300 gluten-free food options as well as a ton of paleo, raw, and vegan options as well. Discover for yourself why 400,000 members, including some of the tech-savvy at-risk youth, believe in Thrive Market. And for every paid Thrive Market membership, a free membership is donated to a family in need in the United States. That is for real. We checked. They are making the world better for everybody. It's never been easier to live healthy. Test drive thrivemarket.com for free for 30 days and get an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. That's an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. If you go to thrivemarket.com slash savage right now, you'll be eating healthier very soon and you'll be helping to support the Savage Lovecast and keep us going. That's thrivemarket.com slash savage. Hi, 
Erin. I'm calling from California. I am a 33-year-old African-American straight woman, big fan of your show, and I am calling today because I have a specific question that I'm almost embarrassed to ask this question because it might make me sound like kind of a bigoted idiot, but this is anonymous, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway. One of my closest friends is a gay man. We've been very close friends since college. And over the years, um, we've known each other for 14 years now, uh, and he's a good person, has been a wonderful friend, except for he has one major personality flaw. And that is that when he is, he's a very insecure person. And when he is in a situation where he's feeling bad about himself, he lashes out at other people, basically by putting them down, making insults. Um, basically, he's one of those people who likes to build himself up by putting other people down. Like, for example, I used to be overweight when I was in college, and I do have some body image issues. And for like, if we're going out to eat, he'll say, like, oh, that's you had three slices of pizza tonight. Oh, I guess the diet's over. And then he'll start making jokes about how the last time he went to the beach, how, you know, fat my thighs looked and cellulite and all that. Just really cruel things. And anytime someone tries to call him on it, he'll kind of get out of it by saying, oh, I was just joking around or, oh, what? I was just being honest. But really, he's just being a jerk because anytime somebody makes him feel small, he lashes out. And anyways, um, about six months ago, everything kind of came to a head with him when I introduced him to a man I've been seeing, a new man I really have been falling in love with, and I don't have a great track record with men, which is another thing he likes to make fun of. But anyway, we, after I was dating this guy for about six months, um, we decided to go hang out so he could meet him, and the second we got to the restaurant, we kind of went to this outdoor bar type restaurant, he just started it on me, just kind of making fun of me, telling um, my new boyfriend, you know, how fat I used to be and that he should watch out for that. And he was also saying, oh, wow, you know, this guy, he's so handsome. He's so good looking. What the hell is he doing with you? And also my new boyfriend happens to be Caucasian. And she's like, oh, he must have a black girl fetish because what the hell should he be doing with you? You know, he could have any woman in the world. And at that point, that was the last straw. And I kind of told him at that point, you know, I've put up with your crap, but you're just an asshole. You know, you have a lot of good qualities, but I'm done. And I told this story to a mutual friend of ours and said, you know, he and I aren't friends anymore, so just we're never going to hang out together anymore. And she said, you know, she understood why, why I was upset, but then said, well, I need to be more sensitive because have you noticed that he only behaves this way when straight men are around? And it was something I had never really noticed before, but looking back over the 14 years that I've known him, his social circle of friends solely consists of other gay men and women, mostly straight women. And looking back again, over time, I've noticed that when it's just he and I, when just the two of us are hanging out or if we're hanging out with other female friends or with his other gay friends, everything's fine. You know, he's fun to be around, good person, good friend. But anytime we're in a social situation where a straight man is around, like if one of our female friends brings her boyfriend or husband or if one of you know, someone else just brings a straight friend around, he almost becomes a different person. He becomes very anxious and very mean. And that's when he starts kind of lashing out with these, I guess, microaggressions, as the kids call them today. And and then my question to you is, and again, this is probably a really stupid, stupid, bigoted question, because it's 2017, we live in Los Angeles, but I was wondering, is this a thing? Are some gay men anxious or uncomfortable around straight men which is why he's acting this way. And do I need to be more understanding of that? Or is this guy just a jerk, asshole, insecure bitch that I need to just, you know, cut out of my life? You present me with an either or choice. Is this a thing? Are some gay men anxious around straight men or is he an asshole? Both those things can be true. It's not necessarily either or. Some gay men are definitely nervous around straight men. Some gay men you know, grew up being bullied and brutalized by straight men. And even if they weren't bullied or brutalized by straight men, some gay men lived in constant fear of being outed and being bullied by homophobic relations, family members, parents, and homophobic peers and classmates. And they're just flinchy around 
straight guys, even if they never got punched in the face by a straight guy for being gay, although many gay men have been punched in the face by straight guys for being gay, some gay men are just flinchy and nervous and anxious around straight guys. That doesn't excuse being an asshole to you about your weight, the color of your skin, your relationship history. You put up with a lot of, I don't think those are quite microaggressions like the kids call them. Those are kind of macroaggressions. And if we're going to be compassionate for this guy who's been such a shitty non-friend to you in the presence of straight men. All right, let's armchair psychoanalyze him. He's nervous around straight guys. He's afraid of straight guys. He's afraid that straight guys are going to do violence for him. So he grabs the nearest straight girl or friend and throws that person under the bus to deflect attention away from his homosexuality, which he worries will attract negative attention from whatever straight guy happens to be in the room with him. He starts pointing out the negative qualities, theoretically negative, subjectively negative qualities of other people in the room. He starts pointing the straight guy's attention toward your weight as it used to be and throwing you under the bus. And that's not okay. Even if that's what's going on, there are limits to what you should have to put up with because somebody else has damage and the onus is on him to fix himself, to get into fucking therapy, to unpack that, particularly if it's costing him friendships, long-term friendships and destroying his relationships with loving, caring, compassionate friends like you. If you owe him anything, it is perhaps this insight that your friend shared with you. You send him a note, send him an email, say, I don't want to be your friend anymore because this happens. And this always happens in the presence of a straight guy. I think you have some sort of fear or flight response in the presence of straight guys. And you instantly, when a straight guy is in the room, start beating other people up. Maybe because you're afraid that if the straight guy looks at you too long and notices your flaws that he might start beating you up. And that's not a rational fear, but sometimes we struggle with irrational fears and insecurities and we act out in strange ways. Strange and in this case, completely unacceptable ways. Cruel and sadistic ways. You should tell him that and say, you need to get your fucking ass to a therapist or this tick of yours, this asshole tick of yours, is going to destroy every friendship that you ever have. Because you know what? They say, we like to say, you know, gay people, we are everywhere. No, you know who's everywhere? Fucking straight people are everywhere because there are a lot more fucking straight people. So everywhere you go, there are going to be straight guys. And if this is how you act in the presence of a straight guy, and I'm not the only one who's noticed this pattern, you're going to nuke your fucking life. You're going to be friendless and alone in life. And you don't want to be friendless and alone. So get to fucking work on this. Maybe after a couple of years of therapy, we can circle back and reconnect and see if we can be friends. But that first time that we meet up, I'm bringing four straight guys with me. Not to bash you, just to test you and make sure that you have overcome this. And then maybe we can be friends again. But right now, we can't be friends. You put up with a lot more shit from this quote-unquote friend than I would have put up with or that anyone should have put up with. There's a limit to compassion. And tolerance of somebody else's shitty behavior. Somebody can behave in shitty, hateful, awful ways because they suffered themselves. And that is an explanation, perhaps. That is a context, but it is not an excuse. It's not a license to move through life being a cruel and vicious asshole and treating the other people around you who had nothing to do with your damage like shit. He needs to take responsibility for that and he doesn't get and he doesn't deserve a pass for that. Certainly not any more passes from you. People ask me all the time how to spice up their sex lives. And often I tell people to get out of their beds and get out of their bedrooms. But eventually we all return to our beds and we all return to our bedrooms. And if you want to keep it hot and keep it sexy and keep it sensuous in the bedroom, you're going to want to have some kick-ass, gorgeous, comfortable sheets on your bed. And you can get great sheets at Bowl and Branch. Dot com. What makes Bowl and Branch sheets unique is that each is crafted from 100% organic cotton. That means Bowl and Branch sheets not only feel incredible, they look amazing. And since Bowl and Branch sells exclusively online, you don't pay that expensive retail markup. That's half the price for twice the quality. And you will, I guarantee it, I promise you, you will love these sheets. Try them for 30 nights and see for yourself. If you are not impressed, you can return them for a full refund. Anyone who sleeps on Bowling Branch sheets loves them. That's why they have thousands and thousands of five-star reviews online. Go check it out. 
Bowling Branch Sheets also make a great gift. They come in a beautiful signature box. Terry and I are going to a couple of gay weddings this summer, and we are gifting Bowling Branch Sheets to the lucky couples. Go to BowlingBranch.com today, and you'll get 50 bucks off your first set of sheets plus free shipping when you use the promo code SAVAGE. That's 50 bucks off plus free shipping right now at BowlingBranch.com. Spelled B-O-L-L and Branch.com, promo code SAVAGE. All right, we're going to take a quick break from your calls because we have a very special guest. All right, people lie. Ask someone who they're going to vote for. Ask them about their sexual orientation, about their porn use, how many condoms they go through in a month. And odds are good. They're going to lie to you. Researchers and pollsters, they know it. They try to control for it, but it's a guessing game. Economist, data scientist, and New York Times writer Seth Stevens Davidowitz discovered a place where everybody seems to be telling the truth. Google searches. He's the author of Everybody Lies, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. Hey, Seth, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Dan. So for the tech illiterate, uh, and I count myself amongst their number, what is big data and how do we distinguish it from little data? Uh, basically, the idea is data used to be small surveys that you ask a few hundred people, uh, what are you going to do? Why do you do the things you're going to, why do you do the things you do? What do you want? And now big data is tends to be data from the internet uh, where we just watch people go through their lives and uh you know, enormous data sets that not only are bigger than we've ever had, but frequently are more honest and more real than any data we've ever previously had. Why are people more honest online when they're asking questions and, and digging? Uh, well, there, 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 there are a couple of reasons. So on Google, in a survey, you never have an incentive to tell the truth. Uh, so if you have a sexual desire, and someone asks you that in a survey, people just assume, well, why do I need to admit it to some random person asking me? I, I get nothing out of this. Mm -hmm. But I have an incentive to type this into a computer, into a search engine, uh, because you, you, you can see the material that you want. And then the strange thing that I learned in doing this research uh, is that people bizarrely confess things to Google. They might type something like, I hate my boss, or I'm sad, or I'm drunk on Google, mm -hmm. without any obvious reason that Google, that Google can help. It's almost like the confessional in Catholicism. Uh, people use Google in that way these days. So everybody lies is the title of the book, but everybody doesn't lie about everything, correct? But about mo uh, yeah, about some true. things, in prefer deeply personal things, are, are what people tend to lie about, because they, they have this desire to be perceived as functional, or normal, or healthy, and then you get online and you are who you actually are. You want to watch the porn you actually want to watch, not watch the porn or pretend to want to watch the porn that other people think you should be watching. So you tell the truth online. And that's what this big data reveals is what these, these truths are, that, that, that little data that surveys in the past couldn't quite capture. Is that accurate? Exactly. Right, that's I, exactly right, yeah. I, I want to share something with you that's in my column next week. I, I wrote this and sent it out and then I read your book. Uh, and I feel like uh, I might have to revise this statement. I got this question. It's short. Incest porn. What is the reason behind why it is so hot? And I wrote, I reject the premise of your question. There's nothing hot about incest porn. <laughs> yeah, so definitely uh, incest porn is shockingly popular. Ah, that's so disturbing. Oh, my God. I have to lie down in a dark room. It's just so disturbing. It's, yeah, well, so I, like, uh, I start telling people, they're like, what's the most shocking thing you found in porn? And I'm like, the popularity of incest porn. And then some people are like, that's not shocking. And I'm like, am I a square? Because I th find that just <laughs> weird and disturbing. I don't know. Uh, but if it disturbs you as well, then I, I think I'm not square for, for it, finding it, that. Uh, it, it does disturb you. You know, I, I, when my first boyfriend a million years ago uh, had a bunch of porn that he liked. And he said, oh, we should watch this. And the title was Brothers Should Do It. And I was like, no, no, we shouldn't watch that. I have brothers. There's nothing sexy about that title. It makes me want to jump yeah. out the window. But reading your right. book discovered, I, I've learned something that even I didn't know that incest porn is shockingly popular, which I find shockingly distasteful. And not, as, not only is it really popular, so part of it is just like, it's a taboo. And I think people like watching things that they're not supposed to watch. And someone watching incest porn doesn't necessarily isn't fantasizing about having sex with a family member. But then if you look at searches for I want to have sex with or I'm attracted to, like a huge percentage of those searches are for family members too. So like this really is, I think, a somewhat common 
desire that people have and never talk about. Okay, that's not a piece of data that you uncovered that I like very much and I'm very comfortable with. But there's actually something that you uncovered that I that I loved uh, because it confirmed something I've always believed and long said. And that's that couples who do everything together, who share all the same friends, are less likely to stay together than couples who have their own friends and spend some time apart. How, where did you find that in the pile of big data out there? Yeah, so that's from Facebook data. So from Facebook, Facebook knows when people are in a relationship and then out of a relationship. And they also know the friend structure. So do you have sh- share the same friends or do you have separate social networks? And it turns out, just as you said, and going against a lot of conventional wisdom, relationships are more likely to last if you have separate social circles if you, uh, uh, rather than if you all share the same group of friends. Which is contrary to, to to the assumptions that so many people make these days, where you know you're the person you're with, your you know your living partner or your spouse is supposed to be your best friend, which places all sorts of strains on a relationship. The best friend and the lover spouse used to be two different roles in a person's life, and we've combined it into one role. We're horrible at making decisions and knowing what's good for us. So all these things come become conventional wisdom of what what we're supposed to do or what. Uh, will make us happy or what will lead to a successful relationship. And uh, a huge percentage of the time, these theories are just dead wrong. Uh, and the data can kind of correct our faulty guesses about what works and what doesn't work. One of the things that's been hardest for people to get a hard number about, starting with Alfred Kinsey a million years ago, is how many people out there are gay. Because there's a lot of incentive in a culture where gay people may be discriminated against or subjected to violence or have been brought up in a faith tradition that tells them that it's sick or sinful or they're going to hell if they're gay. It's really hard to get an honest answer when you ask somebody uh, if he's gay or not. But you think you found it in the data? Uh, well, I, I think I have a, a pretty good estimate. I don't know. You know, it, I mean, it's it's hard to define exactly what it means. Uh, to be gay, it's not something that, that you know, the, the number's not, we're never going to know exactly like 4.8673% of men are gay. Uh, but I think it's somewhere in the range of 5% mm. of men are gay. It's definitely not 10%, as, as Kinsey initially said, and it's not 2%. Uh, so so if, if you ask people in surveys now, you get about 2% or 3% of men say they're gay. Mm-hmm. And the number's way lower in places where it's hard to be gay, in places like Mississippi and Tennessee and South Carolina. But if you look at porn data, it's a little bit lower there because some men who are born in Mississippi move out to places where it's easier to be gay, to California or D.C. or New York. Mm-hmm. But it's not much lower. It's a close to 5% uh, everywhere. So I think uh, you know it's, it's somewhere in, that, in the neighborhood of, of, of 5% of men, I would say. But not everybody who's watching gay porn is gay. There's a lot of women out there who watch gay male porn. There's pro- there may be some bi guys out there who are watching gay porn or people who are watching taboo porn to crank themselves up. So is it a, is it a perfect measure? No, definitely not. I, I, well, I try to divide it into men versus women, which also isn't perfect because in the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So it's a little <laughs> imprecise. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, th- I think, I, again, it's, it's not, I don't want to say that it's a, that it's a perfect measure. It's exactly 5%. I also look at some data from Facebook on where gay men are born. Like there are some parts of the country where now it's, it's much, it's, you know, just about, uh, I think it's 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 pretty, it's fairly easy to be gay if you're a high school student in Berkeley, California, mm-hmm. or certain parts of the Bay Area, and and there it approaches about five percent. So that's another way to to look at it as the data. But mm-hmm. I think uh, I I definitely don't think I, I definitely don't think we can use this data uh, just as you say it, it's it's imprecise. But you can kind of say it's not ten percent because if it was ten if it were ten percent, there would just be a lot more gay porn being searched. And I think there would also be a lot more uh, gay men gay men among uh, you know, younger men born in Berkeley or, or, or San Francisco, and it's not two percent just because uh, there would be there. There clearly are more gay men in Mississippi or Alabama than say they're gay. So we kind of can kind of narrow the range around five percent, even if we can't know exactly for sure what how many. And, and as you say, it's it's not, it's it's not so easy to define anyway. So you know, this is a sex and relationship advice show, and I, I'm asking a lot of questions about. The sex stuff in the book, which is fascinating, and well, it's a, it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty big theme because that's kind of one area where people do lie so much, particularly in the United States, because there's so much taboo around talking about sex. So uh, it is, and 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 I think the porn data is pretty revolutionary. Uh, look into sexuality uh, relative to the data we previously had. But just so people who uh, are going to pick up the book, and I encourage people to pick up the book, it's it's fascinating, and, and I loved it. 
Uh, so they're braced. What initially brought you uh, to this data set or, or made you uh, assess it in this way and begin to dig was really disturbing stuff about race and racism and people's racist attitudes. Yeah, yeah. So I started this research back in 2012. And back in that day, those days, people thought we lived in a post-racial society. Uh, and if you ask people in surveys, uh, you know, are you racist? You know, nobody says they're racist. Or do you care that Obama was black when you were deciding whether to vote for him? And nobody says that they cared. But I was shocked on Google, the frequency with which people made racist searches, uh, particularly for jokes mocking African-Americans. And I was also shocked where people were making these searches, that these searches were not just concentrated in the deep south, where I, where uh, historically we have thought as, of racism as being highest, but also were many places in the north, in industrial Michigan and western Pennsylvania and eastern Ohio and upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And then uh, these racist searches on Google were predicting a lot of behaviors, particularly in the political realm, such as opposing Barack Obama or in the recent election, supporting Donald Trump in the primary. It's so distressing. It's so incriminating. You know, there's a story that we like to tell ourselves about where we are as a culture, particularly a story we like to tell ourselves and we really enjoyed hearing after the election of Barack Obama in 2008 and his re-election in 2012. And it's not borne out by the data. There's a lot more racism boiling under the surface, as I think is now undeniably evident by the because of the election of Donald Trump than AT&T commercials and a lot of the crap on television would have led us to believe. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and I think it's it's better to know that. And I think it's also a lot of, you know, I talk about not just racism against blacks, although I think, uh, it, to be honest, from the online data, I studied all kinds of, uh, you know, anti-Semitism and uh, anti-gay attitudes and, and anti-woman uh, attitudes. But I really think the number one uh, one that takes the cake in, in, in people's online behavior is, is this racism against black people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think for, for African Americans, uh, a lot of the, a lot of African Americans have read my book and have, uh, you know, given me feedback. And I think there is something a little, uh, obviously it's really disturbing, but there is, there is a little bit of like, we told you, so, like we right. told you so. And yeah, it, we're it, not crazy. It, I, I don't think yeah, like, like I, you know, I, talk, I talked to a black friend about the book, who, and I was telling him about the, 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 the beginning of the book where you start with these racial attitudes and people searching for racist jokes. And he looked at me and said, yeah, we're not – we haven't been lying to you. We're not crazy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, so it is like a little bit uh, – yeah, exactly. So, like, so I think it is a little validating maybe because uh, you know, this is something that African Americans have been saying for years, that despite what people are saying in surveys, Mm -hmm. uh, like they really are victims of racism in large numbers. And I think this data just makes it unambiguous. All right. Zooming out from the race and sex issues, what's the ultimate takeaway uh, from Everybody Lies? Trust no one? Or if you really want to know who someone is, look at their Google search history? Well, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's trust no one. I think there is a little bit. I, I like to do it as an optimistic book in a way in that, we can change the world and improve the world if we know the truth. Don't, don't trust necessarily surveys or what people are telling us, but if we look at the online data, we can learn the truth and ultimately improve society. So The survey tells us who we wish we were, but the big data set tells us who we actually are, and we should probably... Who we actually are, but maybe with it, we can turn who we actually are closer to who we wish we are uh, if we have enough data on, on this. So uh, I, I don't think we just... I don't think we just have to throw up our hands and say, oh, we're all horrible. I think we can say, okay, there is a lot of bad stuff and we can maybe learn how to uh, fix this. The book is Everybody Lies, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. Seth Stevens Davidowitz, thank you so much for coming on the show. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed the book and was thrilled to get to talk to you about it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dan. I, I'm a big fan of your show. I don't know about you guys, but I would rather gnaw my own leg out of a bear trap then go shopping for clothes. I do not have that gay gene, that gay shopping for clothes gene, which isn't exclusive to gay guys, it seems, because there's a lot of well-dressed straight guys in the world these days. But I don't have that gene. The musical comedy gene, the no gag reflex genes, got those. Not the clothes shopping gene. I haven't stepped foot in a mall or really a store to buy clothes in decades. So you can imagine, that means I'm still wearing clothes I went to college in. It's true. So you can imagine my delight when I heard about 5-4 Club. Each month, 5-4 Club sends you a curated box of two to three items that are handpicked to match the current season and your style. They've been helping men with fashion for over 15 years, and they ship to 100,000 men every month. 
and they know what they're doing. So if you don't, that is okay. If you're like me and you don't know what you're doing when it comes to clothes shopping, it is okay. 5-4 Club will help you build your wardrobe one month at a time. And having nice looking clothes makes a lot of guys feel more confident. And confidence is key, as we've discussed on this program many, many times, to getting your ass laid. So think about using 5-4 Club, where you get $120 worth of clothes for just $60 a month. You can pause or cancel at any time, no commitments. And as a 5-4 Club member, you'll also receive up to 50% off items in their online shop and access to exclusive member-only items, free shipping, and size exchanges. Go to 5-4Club.com right now and enter promo code SAVAGE, S-A-V-A-G-E, and they'll give you 50% off your first month's package plus a free pair of sunglasses. That's 50% off your first package at 5-4 Club, spelled F-I-V-E-F-O-U-R-C-L-U-B dot com, promo code SAVAGE. 5-4Club.com, promo code SAVAGE. Hey, Dan. I am a 31-year-old uh, bisexual female living on the East Coast. Um, I just got out of a relationship of five or six years, and so I'm, quote-unquote, back on the market. And <laughs> of all the questions I've thought to ask you over the years, I never thought this would be the one, but here I am. Uh, hey, Dan, what the fuck do we do about ghosters? So if I haven't met someone in person and he ghosts me, is that okay? If I've seen someone a couple times and then I get ghosted, am I supposed to just let it go? Uh, what response means I'm being desperate and which means that I'm sticking up for myself? I just, uh, shit, damn, these are new. <laughs> this is a brand new world. Silence is the new, it's not you, it's me. Welcome back to the dating scene in the ghosting era. You can call people. You can keep texting them and demanding uh, an explanation, demanding a reason why they went silent on you, why they ghosted you. And even if they call you back, even if they give you a reason, it's not going to be the reason. It's going to be an excuse. It's going to be a face-saving white lie and a your face-saving white lie. It's going to be, it's not you, it's me. It's just not right. So da, da, da. Uh, I think that it's a cowardly thing to do just to go silent on someone. I think silence is more painful than a text saying, look, I'm just not interested, but thank you. It was nice to meet you. But it seems to be an established social more now. It seems to be a social norm that someone who goes silent on you, you are supposed to provide closure to yourself. And I think closure is something we do for ourselves, not something that people do for us. And just read into that what it means. They're not interested. That's why they're not responding to your texts anymore. That's why you're not hearing from them anymore. They are not interested. And that's the best explanation you're ever going to get because people – because people aren't monsters, even people who ghost people aren't necessarily monsters, typically don't and shouldn't bust out all the real reasons they're not interested in continuing to see you because they could be shattering or ego shredding or fill someone with insecurities about their bodies or their looks or their breath or the size and shape of their genitalia or whatever else, whatever the real reasons are why they aren't interested. He will never give the real reasons. We always have to Wonder what the real reason might be and wonder if it was indeed us. And if it keeps happening over and over again, maybe it is us and there's something about ourselves that we need to sit down with friends and ask for their honest, brutal feedback about so we can maybe make some changes around the margins. Hard to change who we really are at our cores, but around the margins, maybe we can listen more on dates. Maybe we can practice better personal hygiene. Whatever the reasons you get, not from the people who dumped you, but from your friends when you sit them down and ask them why I keep getting ghosted or dumped and ask for their brutal, honest feedback, those reasons, maybe you can do something about those. But yeah, ghosting, it's a thing. It's how people do it now or don't do it now or stop doing it or stop doing you now. Welcome to this brave new world of cowards. Hi, Dan. Got to take an issue with just one small bit of the advice you gave to the guy in episode 556 who doesn't know how to not seem desperate when talking to girls. Um, I think most of your advice is spot on. That column is evergreen, really. But um, telling him to just stop hanging out with the girl as soon as she uh, registers that she's not interested in dating him is just going to, like, send home that any gestures of friendship that he made towards her were fraudulent and were, like, just 
designed to entice her into a date. Um, if this dude wants to be better at seeming non-desperate in his relationships, he's going to have to first develop the skill to be friends with women in a genuine way and not just as a potential dating prospect. You know, you don't want to sink too much time into pining for someone without telling them that you have feelings for them, sure, but, you know, you actually do have to first develop the basic relationship skills of being on friendly terms with women before you can really convey to them that you're a trustworthy dating prospect. So, yeah, he uh, shouldn't just stop and uh, peace out on any uh, girls who aren't interested in dating him. He should learn to be a friend first, too. Hi, Dan. This is a response to episode 556 to the guy who wanted to get his first girlfriend. And as a fellow early 20-something guy who has not had a committed relationship or past sexual experience, follow Dan's advice. Just do everything Dan told you. And to add to that, if you are doing something to improve yourself or change your opportunities that doesn't feel right or makes you feel insecure, do something else that makes you feel confident. Doing things that you like to do and things that make you feel radiant in yourself is going to attract people. Things that make you feel good is going to make you a better person and make you more attractive. Hi, Dan. Um, I was calling in response to the 20-year-old who's really worried about feeling desperate or acting desperate when getting into a new relationship for the first time. One piece of advice that I have from the female end of things is learn how to cook. It's brilliant. No girl that I know would ever turn that down or think of it generally as a negative character trait. It works. And plus, you'll get to try a whole bunch of new foods and see more worldly and be more worldly, potentially. Learn how to cook. And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or comment for a future show, please do give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Seth Stevens Davidowitz on Twitter at Seth S underscore D. And be sure to listen to the Feral Attraction podcast and follow them on Twitter at Feral Attract FM. Also, be sure to read my sex advice column, Savage Love, every week in the Baltimore City paper and other newspapers all across the world. And if you like listening to me rant about politics, you can find a lot more of that on Blabbermouth, the Stranger's weekly politics podcast with me, host Eli Sanders, and millennial twerp Rich Smith. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech-savvy at-risk youth and Nancy. We will all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Lovecast. 